Welcome to the AZ Wildcats podcast brought to you by DraftKings. Great deal going on right now. Throw down $5 on an uh, NFL game. And you know what? If you win, you get $280 in free plays. That's simple, that easy. All right. Joined by uh, Mr. AJ Bramlett, NCAA uh, tournament rebound leader, champion. Um, a lot of different ways we can go with that. But first of all, AJ, how you doing, my man? I'm doing great, man. I appreciate you having me today, Mike. It's going to be fun, oh, man. Of course, dude. Really looking forward to this one. Um, we're going to spend most of this going down memory lane. But first and foremost, I wanted to get your take on just watching this year's team and just kind of what you, you know, what you think, some of the similarities. The only thing that I can think of is it's a little similar to the loot teams and that you kind of go on that run there where you can be up yeah. three and then you're up 25 in about a minute period. What's up? Yeah. You know what? I, I'm you know really thrilled with this year's team so far, to be honest. I mean, they're, they're playing the type of basketball, like you said, like that's uh, you know familiar to the coach Olsen era. Um, you know, they're playing free They're They share the basketball, they play fast. Um, and they really, the thing that I've noticed, I've noticed the most about this team is the chemistry. And that's what we had in 97 is every single guy likes each other. You know, you, when you see a guy fall down on the floor, you see all four other four guys run over there and help them up. The bench is animated. You know, they're having fun. They're laughing and they're taking care of business. So that's what you want to see. And that's kind of the similarities that I see. And that's going to take them a long way. Like when you have that kind of energy that's built within the team, you can overcome a lot of obstacles like we did in 97. Right. All right. So let's talk about let's talk about you and we'll get to uh, we'll, we'll get to like the whole journey. But like I was telling you offline, the A.J. Bramlett is one of the more interesting stories in U of A history because I have never seen somebody. And I mean, this improve the way you did in that you you and Donnell, to a lesser extent, Bennett and Gene were beaten up for the majority of that season. You would have guys that say, man, you got four great perimeter guys and yeah. no play down low. And then by the time the NCAA tournament hit, especially in College of Charleston, I think was really the one where it's like, whoa, A.J. Bramlett is no longer a deficiency. He's leading the, he's leading the tournament in rebounding and beating up some of the best players in the country. What happened there? You know what? It was just a process, man. And like, uh, you know, I'd started playing better, uh, you know, the end of the season. I think the last two games of the Pac-10 that year were Cal and Stanford. We lost both. So everybody, you know, wasn't happy about that, obviously. But I had played well in both of those. So like I was feeling good going into the tournament. Um, you know, really, it was just confidence. And, you know, I think you're seeing that with Coloco this year, like a similar kind of thing is where sometimes it just clicks. And like I've been putting in a ton of work. But it was a tough year. Don't, don't get me wrong. You mentioned it. Like people were people were on us, you know, the, the big guys all year long. Like the only problem with this team is the big men. You know what I mean? If, if they only had a, you know, a sufficient big man tandem, like they could go a lot, they could go a long way this year. And so we heard that and we just kept working. And, you know, Coach Olson really, you know, stayed you know positive with us, kept just told us to keep, keep doing what we're doing and that it was going to happen at some point. And for me, it started happening at the end of that season. And then Really, you know, that, those six games were some of the best, you know, stretch of basketball I played during my career. So it was good timing. And, uh, you know, I'm just thankful that it happened during that time for sure. Take us through Lute Olson's kind of process with you, because you come obviously out of La Cueva, New Mexico. You and Kenny Thomas were the big deal in that state yeah. right there. And you arrive at Arizona and your first season – you start, and obviously Joe Blair eligible the first semester, not the second. But then you go in against a guy like a Ben Davis in practice, who is still one of the most underrated players, in my opinion, in program history. How did that get you shaped, you know, for what you were about to embark on the next season? Yeah, and I always say this, like uh, Ben and JB were my my big brothers. You know what I mean? Right. They, they beat me up every day in practice. You know, they elbowed me. They, they taught me, <laughs> you know, how to get tougher that they taught me the tricks of the trade too. And the, the thing I think that they always respected about me was that I played hard. You know what I mean? I wanted to learn. I was open to learning. I barely played that year. I averaged like 1.9 points a game, but right. still played in a lot of big games. You know what I mean? Still got really good experience. We had a ton of depth that year. We had a you know senior laden team that I think we should have went to the final four. If JB doesn't, you know, we lose JB halfway through that season. If we don't lose him, we could have easily been in the final four that year. It still almost made it. You know, to the final four that year, but it was just really a, a learning, learning, uh, you know, experience for me, a testing ground, and it taught me, you know, the things that I needed to do to be successful. And then the next year, when I got the opportunity, still, it didn't. I wasn't all the way there, like you said. It took me, you know, half or almost all the season to get to, you know, the player that I wanted to be. But you could see steps started building, 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 and then that was all because of the foundation from the, the year before. 
Okay, so before the season starts, all the hype is around this guy that's coming in named Mike Bibby. <laughs> and it, it's weird, too, because, you know, it, Lou, Lou Olson's empire was built. You know, a lot of it was on guys like you, Miles, JT, Michael Dickerson, guys who would probably be the equivalent of top 50 to 100 players, you know, something like that, you know, if the rankings were really the way they are now. Mm-hmm. Mike Bibby comes in here. And he's all everything. I mean, you could look at it and outside of maybe Kobe Bryant, this is maybe the best player in the country. He, When Mike Bibby stepped foot on campus right there, and I wanted to get to your relationship with JT on this in just a minute, but when Mike Bibby steps foot on campus, what were your first impressions? What was it like? Just kind of take us through that, you know, that era right there. Yeah, well, I mean, Coach Olson had told us about Mike, you know, beforehand because he had committed early. And so even when, you know, I was going to go to Arizona, he's like, in a couple of years, we got a guy coming that's, you know, going to be really, really good. Right. And, you know, he's going to help us win a lot of games. And I think that we can do something special with him. And so Mike was just, I mean, he's the, I'll say this, he's the best basketball player I ever played with. Like he knew from an IQ perspective and a point guard perspective, he knew who needed a shot when, how the game was going, if he needed to score, if, uh, you know, Mike, Michael Dickerson hadn't had a shot in, you know, two or three possessions, he would find Mike D an easy basket. If I hadn't gotten it, he'd make sure that I got fed, you know, so I'd keep running and rebounding. Like he's like a basketball genius. And so Coach Olson really turned over the, you know, the keys to him right away. And we jumped on board because why wouldn't you want to? I mean, he's hitting you with passes when you don't even know you're open. You can have easy layups and dunks. Like right, you want right, to with a guy sure. like Mike. He's unselfish. Yes, he could score the ball, but he was a true, true point guard and four general. And so he was just amazing, man. It was. I always say that I'm lucky to have been able to play with a player like Mike. Okay, so you guys head into North Carolina. You're going to play. Uh, you're going to play him in Springfield, Massachusetts. First game of the year. The team captain, Miles Simon is announced that he's going to be out for at least the first semester. So you're going with the starting lineup then where you got Mike Bibby, you got JT, you got Michael Dickerson, Bennett Davison, and then yourself. You're going against a team that's got Vince Carter, Ed Cota, Antoine Jameson. Take us through the butterflies that I know had to have been in your, you know, because you're going to be, you're going to be going against some of the best big men in the country, Serge Zwicker. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was a, it's a big time game to start off your season. And, you know, that's right. the one thing about that I loved about Coach O and playing in Arizona is that we always played the best. We never ducked anybody. We never took, you know, took it easy on the schedule to try to pad wins. We played the best schedule and toughest schedule early on in the season so that by the time we got to the tournament, you know, we'd be battle ready. And, that, you know, that's what happened this year, obviously. But that first game, I mean, we, we didn't know what we had. We knew that we were talented. We knew that we liked each other and that we all got along. And then, you know, Mike was really the one in that game. Mm-hmm. He had 22 points in that game against Ed Cota, who was considered, you know, one of the top 20 guards, you know, in the nation uh, that year. And Mike just came out and showed everybody in the first game that this dude is a lot older than, than his freshman years would say he is. And so right. it was just fun, though. But it, that's a big win. I mean, to get a win like that, you know, in the first game of the season, all eyeballs are on us. Um, you know, it was just a good game for us. All right, so let's fast forward then. You guys go 19-9 and during the regular season, kind of backdoor your way into the tournament. Michael Dickerson, for a good percentage of before Miles came back, is the one that's really kind of leading scorer. He was, Mike D was kind of the underrated guy in that whole squad. You, you go into a can, you go into the Sweet 16. You're going to be playing the Kansas Jayhawks. And you still get people to this day, even with all his championships, that maintain that Roy Williams is, that that was Roy Williams' best team. You got Jacques Vaughn, you got Jared Hass, you got Paul Pierce, you got Rafe LaFrance, you got Scott Pollard. Yep. Arizona's coming in, and you know, you're 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 viewed as a year away almost. Right. You're so you go into that game, you're heavy underdogs. What is the mindset like behind the scenes? What is your mindset like going into that game? And you know, I've said this before, and I'll I don't understand or I don't know how to quite put this, but like we knew we were gonna win that game. Like mm-hmm. we right. we were confident, we were cocky, we were like we were right. there, you know, joking around and shooting around, like we were loose, like nobody was nervous. Like we just had that kind of energy going during that time that we knew we were gonna win. We we, we no one else gave us a shot at all. Right. Nobody, you know, they were like, Okay, good run, you guys made it sweet sixteen, we'll come back, check on you guys next year, you know, when, when you have a chance to make the final four. But we just we had that energy and that kind of camaraderie that we were going to win that game. So we went in there confident, and you right. know, we really we really weren't surprised that we beat them because we thought that we would. 
Um, but it was still like looking back at it now, I don't know why we were so I don't know why we were so confident. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, AJ, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go a step further here and we'll get back to that in a second. I believe that, and I've looked at it, I can't remember a team, and again, a lot of this was the next year, but when you think about it, you guys had more talent than Kansas did, which is crazy to say, but you had two guys in Mike Bibby, Michael D or in Miles Simon, who were first team all Americans the following season. Michael Dickerson, by the way, is a third team all American. Jason Terry goes on to be the national player of the year two years after that. Oh, you got your you got yourself, you got Bennett Davis, and you had more talent than Kansas, which is crazy <laughs> to think at that time. Yeah, we did, but we just weren't, I mean, we were young, you know what I mean? We hadn't proven anything at that point, but you're absolutely right. Like we, we were confident with the group that we had mm -hmm. and we knew that we could match up with them. I think, you know, inside was going to be the biggest challenge for it. You know, Bennett, and myself and, you know, Gene and Donnell, all of those guys, all of us in that game played one of our best games defensively and just doing what we needed to do to win. And so battling those guys and, you know, I think Pollard had zero points and one rebound in that game or something like that. And, you know, the friends played, played really well, but we got them into some foul trouble. So we were able to do what we needed to do. And, you know, other guys just, you know, Miles and, and Mike Bibb and JT hit some big free throws in that game. Mike D played well that game against Paul Pierce. He already had, always had a little rivalry with Paul Pierce. Right. So he wanted to play good against Paul every time. Right. So, you know, it was just a fun game to play in. It's still, still one of my greatest memories of my basketball career, no doubt. Okay. Did you guys, so you get into the, you guys, every game you played was close. I mean, you added, you added years onto everybody's life, right? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. right. No, call us. <laughs> exactly. So everybody's thinking, okay, we get through Kansas. Whew. All right. We got a, you're playing Providence. You know what? We should be able to cruise that game a little bit. You know, they got some players. You got a Crozier, a God Sham God, a Jamel Thomas, but you know, you just beat Kansas. You guys still took us down to the wire <laughs> in that one. What happened there? They were tough, man. You know, they were a good Big East team. Uh, Jamel Thomas was great. God Cham God had one of his best games. Uh, you know, they had Ruben Garces down in the middle, big, big yep. strong. I played with him overseas actually mm -hmm. after that. And, uh, but they were uh, they were tough. They were just gritty. You know, they did they wouldn't go away. We couldn't put away. We got up a little bit, but they always battled back. And then they had a shot to actually win that game uh, to, before we went into overtime. And uh, I think it was their point guard um, shot the ball late, and missed it. And, we got an opportunity to go to overtime and, and were able to pull it out, but that was a physical game, man. I remember that they were the, they were sending two guys to box me out every single time. I think I had like three. I was the leading rebound in the tournament, but I think I had like three rebounds in that game because I just couldn't right. get any rebounds. And Bennett had one of his best games in the tournament. I think he had a double double in that game. Yep. played really, really well. And so, guys, I mean, but we just we were winners at that point. We were just we knew that we could pull stuff out. We were confident, you know, even at the end of games that we'd be able to make the plays that that would help us win the games. And we went out and did it. Right. Okay. So you go get into the final four. First time, and I always tell people this because it's been so long since we've been to a final four. But, you know, when, when I was growing up, it was almost like a rite of passage. Every fourth year, we'd get to the final four. It was 88. It was 93. It was 97. It was 01. You're playing Carolina again. and this, But this time, you got Miles. So, you know, and, and Miles was kind of, I mean, everybody had swag to a certain extent, but miles was really kind of that <laughs> yeah. dude. So you go into that game with miles at that point, what is your mindset like? Well, I mean, we, we were confident again, but um, you know, having miles back obviously gave us a, uh, you know, a, a big lift and you're right. Like miles had a different air about him. You know what I mean? Like he was just not going to lose. Um, and he was let you know that he was not going to lose, <laughs> which, right. which I loved. You know what I mean? We were all right. cocky and young at that point, which was fun. And, you know, really gave us, you know, uh, uh, advantages against some of these teams. But North Carolina came out and punched us in the mouth in that game. We were down, like, you know, right away. And uh, Vince Carter was catching alley-oops. And, you know, they were dunking on us. And it was a bad start. But, you know, we were able to weather that storm. And Mike had a – Mike Bibb had a really good game that game. I think hit a bunch of three-pointers. And, you know, we were able to, you know, kind of corral Zwicker in the middle. And, you know, really Donnell and, and Gene and everyone on the inside did a good job on Jameson. And so we were all able to – kind of do what we needed to do to win. And that's what Coach O put us in a position to do. Like, we scouted those guys really, really well. And so – and every opponent, really. And so we were always prepared. We just had to go out there and execute, and we were able to do that. And that was a tough game. I mean, all, it, there was no easy games in this tournament. You know, the first two weren't easy, and neither was neither were the final four games, of course. Now, you were kind of synonymous with Jason Terry during your time here as, you know, this I, this is one of my favorite <laughs> magazines that I got right here. <laughs> uh, tell – 
people when people that don't know that era, they don't understand the sacrifice that a guy like a JT made because people, I mean, again, when Miles was ineligible, Jason Terry, and you guys were ranked, I think, ninth in the nation when yeah. Miles came back. You're 11 and two. JT's playing incredibly good ball. What happens when Miles comes back and is reinserted into the lineup and JT goes to the bench? What was the, you know, the thought process with that team right there and JT uh, in specific? Well, I mean, you know, we, we looked at it like there was only a certain guy that could to handle that, really. Right. And keep the team going in the right direction. And Miles wasn't, I mean, my, Miles wasn't going to come off the bench. Mike D wasn't going to the bench. And right. And Gibb was not going to the bench either. Right, so right. AT went and actually volunteered that. He went to Coach Olson and said, hey, I know this is coming down the line. Like we, and we talked about it, you know, like how are we going to weather this? Is it because we wanted Miles back, but right. we knew it was going to, you know, have some kind of, you know, effect on the team when he came back jt went talked to coach o and said hey look i volunteer i'll go to the bench you know i, I can handle it and coach o told him hey you're going to the bench but you're still going to be in there the <laughs> crunch right. time you know when we need you and you're still going to play the minutes that you can play and he did it and jt volunteered it so it was a much more smooth transition and really that's one of the and people don't you know remember that now but that's one of the really deciding factors of really helped us to be able to win the championship that year was keeping that chemistry you know in line where we were able to build and not have any disruption, really, um, you know, as we went through that tournament. Well, and think about it this way. So then you go into the championship game against Kentucky. And, you know, Rick Pitino has been there before. He's already won one. Lutz obviously not won one, but he's been to the Final Four. And it goes down to the stretch like everybody knew that it was going to. And you go out into the uh, – you go into overtime, and, you know, Mike D was struggling a little bit. He's on the bench. Jason Terry's in there at that point. That to me is just the whole thing. And then he makes a big shot right there. But that was really kind of symbolic of that team that you had there. And I don't think we've seen necessarily anything like it since then, the camaraderie that you all had to be able to make those sacrifices. Yeah. I mean, we were really close. And I, I tell people this all the time. I've been on, you know, championship teams uh, in high school and overseas and, you know, all kind of different championship teams. They all have similar, you know, characteristics that make them a good team. You know what I mean? And right. chemistry is the number one thing. And that team had just a pure love for each other. Like nobody right. was nobody was trying to go to the league. You know what I mean? Nobody was worried about their own agendas. We knew Mike Bibby was going to go, you know, that right. was already before he got here, we knew he was going. But right. like everybody else was just and we were just all on the same page. We all fought for each other. Nobody cared who scored or who made the big plays at the end of the game. All we wanted to do was win. And, then, and that's what really was able to propel us through all those games and, and you know, lead us to the only number one – our team to beat three number one seeds, man. That was that was it. It was the energy of the team. Okay. Let's see. I've got a quick read here. DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX. You throw down uh, five bucks, you get $280 in free plays if your NFL team you bet on hits. You know, if DraftKings was around when the U of A was playing, you'd probably want to bet on the over on all those games because of uh, the amount of talent that that team had out there. Um, again, 21 and up, Arizona only. If you got a gambling issue, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP. They'll get you taken care of. And like I said, Arizona back then was always the team that you would go with and say, you know what, you get $100, you get free – or 100 uh, points, you get free tacos there. And <laughs> and that's just the way it was. So, again, that's the way it would have been back in the day right there. All right, all right AJ. Now I want to get to – obviously, 97-98 is a smooth ride. Utah surprises everybody right there, you know. Andre Miller still I, has a triple double, I think, in that yeah, game. No, yeah, but, strong triple double. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it wasn't one of those 10, 10, and ten. No, it was like eighteen. I saw it the other day because they were showing it during the U of A right. game when they played Utah the other day. It was eighteen uh, points, fourteen rebounds, thirteen assists. Like that's right. unheard of. Yeah. All right, so I want to talk about then. I think the next year where you guys really because there's no expectations then the following season or very very few from a national perspective because you lose Bibby, you lose Simon. You lose Michael Dickerson, you lose Bennett Davison. So you're coming back in. You got Jason Terry and AJ Bramlett. Yep. Those are the two heads of the team. You got to, you know, you you're bringing in Richard, you're bringing in Michael Wright, Ruben Douglas, guys like that. But you two are going to be the, uh, you know, you're the linchpins. What was both of your mentalities like? And talk a little bit about what Coach Olson came to you saying. You know, AJ JT, this is your team right here. Yeah, he'd always, I mean, he'd always kind of prepared us for that. You know what I mean? And he talked about it, that it was coming down the line. And, you know, you we 
that's why he JT was able to take that role early on. It's because Coach Olson promised him your time is going to come where you're going right. to be the the head of this team and you're going to get your opportunity to shine. And nobody shined better than JT that year for sure. But you know, he just gave us the opportunity to be leaders. And we had learned that, just like I said before, I learned that from Joseph Blair, Ben Davis, JT had learned that from Reggie Geary and, you know, guys like that. So when we got to that point, it was our opportunity to kind of put a stamp on on our season um, and be the leaders of the team. And we embraced that because he and I were the only two in our class. We came in together right. been through, you know, all of this stuff, you know, the three years prior. And then we finally got the opportunity to kind of be the leaders of these new guys. And, you know, we had talent, man, Richard and Luke and Michael Wright and, you know, uh, Ruben Douglas, all those guys were, were great players, but they were all just young guys. You know what I mean? So it was a, it was a little bit different. <laughs> I remember watching the first game of the season because before you guys would always be able to pick teams apart because you had five, six different dudes, you know, like we talked about. You could be go big. Bennett could go big. All the perimeter guys could go big. Ten, the Tennessee, your Tennessee game, first game of the season, and, you know, you're doing your thing, but it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one show with Jason Terry doing his thing. That was yeah. when I really kind of realized I'm like, this guy's going to have a massive season. Did you <laughs> – now, listen, I know he's your, he was your boy, but did you realize that he was going to do that? No. To be honest, no. Like, I, I don't right. think he did. I, don't, I think he believed he could, but I think it was even, you know, a little bit surprising to him. But he was ready, man. Like, he he really knew that that, that year he was going to have an opportunity to, you know, really lead the team and also get himself a chance to go to the NBA, and he wanted to do right. that. And so he worked his ass off all summer. You know what I mean? It, it really turned himself into just a better player all around and really a, just a deadly scorer. Like we had seen him score the years before. He'd always hit big shots and, you know, he would score mm -hmm. points. But this year he was doing it all. You know what I mean? You know, one-on-one, right. -on -one, three-pointers. He was hitting half-court shots. He was doing like everything. Right. And so, you know, it was really – I think it's one of the, you know, greatest stories in college basketball that a guy that sat there – you know, I mean, it took a, a role, you know, a smaller role for three years is now the national player of the year in his last year. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Well, yeah. And it's weird, too, because still in that conference at the time, UCLA still had a guy like a Baron Davis. Yep. And, you know, you had a Baron Davis and Earl Watson. Maybe it was just me from an outsider perspective, but it always looked like Terry was a little bit more feisty in those games, you know, because Baron Davis kind of had that Mike Bibby reputation, you know, the very precocious guy. And Terry came in, and he wasn't backing down from him in the least. No, not at all. They were, and they were, I mean, they were competitors, man. They would go right. at each other. And it was, you know, every time they got an opportunity to show, prove who was the, the better player, they were going at each other's heads. <laughs> so right, for was, sure. I always knew he had a little bit more, you know, extra in the tank for those games, and he always played well. So, you know, right. Barron, but Barron was a heck of a player, man, and, and a, oh. uh, you know, competitor as well. So it was just fun to be in those type of wars with those guys. You know, the Pac-10 really hasn't seen anything like your guys' era since then when you think about it, because – UCLA was a consistent national title contender under Jim Herrick. Obviously, some things happened there. You guys were under Lute Olson. You won a national title. So did UCLA. Stanford was always in the top 10. You guys, your conference, AJ, really took a backseat to nobody. No, I mean, there was, and that's what I say, even when, you know, the year that we won a championship, like the conference was tough every single year. And like, you know, right. Powell was good back then. Like, you know, there was a lot of teams that, that were good. And there, there was no gimmies, you know, in the conference at that time. Maybe – Oregon State, maybe, but besides right. that, there was no, there was no gimmies. And you know, it was just, it was a, it was a tough go through the Pac-10, you know, conference schedule every single year. And but that really prepared us well for the tournament. So I thought you saw, you know, a lot of Pac-10 Pac teams back then, you know, having deep runs in the tournament because we were beating up on each other, you know, the entire, uh, you know, conference season and getting that competitive, uh, you know, experience in, so that it paid off in the long term once you got to March. All right, I'm going to go back here in a second. I want to talk a little bit about your recruiting process here and everything that kind of came about because it was a little bit of an interesting story. But again, as we just talked about, DraftKings Sportsbook app, code word PHNX, throw down $5 on any uh, NFL game for new customers only. And if you score or they win, get $280 in free points. AJ, I was trying to help the people make some money here. I told him to bet on the Buccaneers or the, uh, the Chiefs. And you know what? Both of those ones hit right now. Those are uh, those are gimme games right now. So go my ahead man. and my good get, picks. Good picks. <laughs> go ahead. What is what's your what's your uh, team outside of the U of or what what's your pro team? Uh, are we talking football? Or are we talking about yeah? Basketball? We're talking football. Yeah, football. Uh, Bears fan. I'm originally Bear. from Illinois. Yeah, originally from DeKalb, Illinois. So DeKalb. I was going to say right. 
Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, you know what? Don't bet on the Bears this past year if you were going to go in with that, but it's maybe next year. <laughs> right, for sure. For a while. <laughs> okay, let's talk about your recruitment then because generally you looked at all the, the players that Arizona was bringing in during about the 10-year period, lots from L.A., a lot from the Pacific Northwest. Nobody really – a couple in-state kids here and there, but not a ton of – you know, obviously, well, no, nobody from New Mexico. And honestly, I didn't even know that New Mexico like produced really good basketball players until you and Kenny Thomas hit the scene. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a fertile you know ground for recruiting. It hasn't been, but you know, nowadays it's it's a lot better now. But like we, there weren't you know big big uh, players in New Mexico at all. So like right. it was Kenny Kenny Thomas, myself, and then there was another guy, uh, Taman Dubzalski. That went to Duke. They went were all Duke. the same year. Yeah, all three guys out of New Mexico. And so I didn't know about Taman. Yeah, was yeah, he a military? Was he military? Um, he went to Nimi. Yeah, he went to the New okay. Mexico Military Institute. He played for them, but right. yeah, he was the one that was a McDonald's All American. Like Kenny right. and I, we weren't because they were going right. to take three guys from New Mexico for sure. They were <laughs> right, right, right. So, so what was your? Yeah. What was your? Go ahead. No, it, yeah, it was. A, it was just a, a process. I mean, uh, I was being heavily recruited by obviously UNM, uh, the Lobos, and. Um, I really only took two visits, one to University of New Mexico and one to Arizona. So those were the only two official visits I took. So how did Lute, when did Lute first make contact with you? What was his pitch? How did that all come about? <laughs> that happened uh, my junior year because we played in the, you remember back then there was only a few like AAU tournaments, not like it yeah, is now. Like the BCI. Tournament. and It was the BCI. So we played in the BCI, playing for New Mexico Flight. Kenny and I played on the same team. And we actually won the BCI. It's like this little team from New Mexico. Wow. We beat New York Riverside. We beat Dallas. We beat California. We beat all of these teams that ran through the tournament. So after that is when, like, we really started getting on the map. And so that's when Coach really got a chance to see me play. And that's when my recruitment picked up pretty heavily after that tournament. So what was his what was his pitch then to you? You know, come in because you keep in mind you're not going in there to you're not going in to start immediately because you got JB, you got a Ben Davis. What was his pitch to you right there? His pitch was actually exactly how it turned out, which was you're going to come here. You know, I see a lot of potential, <clears throat> excuse me, in you. And, you know, you're going to be with uh, Ben Davis and, and Joseph Blair next year. Hopefully, you know, you, they can teach you and teach you the ropes and, and you know, uh, show you how to, how to become an Arizona Wildcat and play like a Wildcat. And then after that, you know, it's really up to you. But if you come in here and work hard, you're going to have a good opportunity to win games. And Mike Bibby's coming down the line. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> He's going to make your job a little easier on exactly, the offensive end. Exactly. <laughs> so you got all right. So you end up signing with Arizona. Then now I wanted to talk before we kind of close everything up. I wanted to talk about your relationship with Jason Terry because every magazine, every time, like I would, you know, be or you know, you guys were always together. It was you two. Did you guys just bond immediately, or how did that? How did that come about? So. The first time that we met was actually in Albuquerque. It was before we, either of us had got to Tucson. There was a, a all-star game, the Reebok All-American game. It was played mm -hmm. in Albuquerque in the pit. And I was on the, the, the West team, and JT was on, on on the other team. And so that's how we met. We met uh, actually in the, in the mall in Albuquerque, walking through there. Wow. And just bumped into each other and said, oh, dude, are you going to Arizona too? It's like, oh, my name's AJ. I'm JT. And that's how right. we met. And so ever since then – like we were, we were the only two in our class. So right. we were together. We lived in the dorms at Navajo Pinal. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? <laughs> and then we moved right. Yeah, for sure. Lived together for four years. You know what I mean? And that's my brother. You know, until right. this day, still the same. Man, like, that guy's my guy. What? He, and just like you, he hasn't aged at all. He looks the exact same. I mean, he doesn't have hair anymore, but he looks the exact same. He's never going to change, man. He looks exactly right. the same. He's doing a great job up there in Grand Rapids too, in the in the what, G League right now. What made What made Loot so great? What made him just because, I mean, you see it up and down. There's teams like you look at Kentucky the other year. You guys never had down seasons, even when nothing was expected. And I always bring this up, 95, 96, you enter the season unranked. And within, what, two weeks, you're in the top 10, top five. What made him so great at being able to mold rosters like that? You know what? The, and I say this, um, you know, Coach O didn't just recruit basketball players. He recruited people. He recruited, right. your, he recruited your personality. Right. And he was a master of putting guys together that liked each other, that would mm -hmm. fit well. Their basketball games obviously fit well, but their personalities fit well. So when you have a team like that and you're able to build that kind of chemistry, then you're gonna be you're gonna be able to play, 
you know, and exceed expectations. And that's what Coto was able to do year after year after year. Right. AJ, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, I'd love to have you on again there or later. I feel like there's still so much stuff that we didn't even touch on, but um, Anytime, I'd man. love to have you back on my man. Oh yeah, for sure, man. That'd be great. You let me know. Okay. AJ, and by the way, tell everybody now what you're doing. What are you up to right now? What's what's going on in AJ Bramlett's world? Yeah, so um, I'm living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I work uh, and do business and sponsorship development for the New Mexico Activities Association, which for you guys out there is like the AIA. So I do right. uh, work directly with high school sports. And then I also do a, a, a podcast, uh, Bear Down Ballers uh, podcast. Uh, it focuses okay. on Arizona basketball, tells some old stories, you know, links up with, with the old guys and the new guys. It just tries yeah. to – you know, keep that passion going for Arizona hoops because I bleed it every day, man. And it's um, you can find it on Spotify or you know Apple Music, whatever, whatever you guys uh, you know, download your podcast from. It's on there. And so, yeah, it's just been fun, man. It's been fun uh, getting to be connected to the program and watch this run that they're on this year. Hopefully, it ends you know positively and uh, yeah. with a Final Four uh, berth, man, because I think they have a chance to do it. AJ, like I said, I've never seen anybody imp- improve. Not just like over a career, but in one season like you, dude. I mean, that was a pleasure to watch up close because honestly, Arizona's known as a basketball school and 97 to 97 doesn't happen without you. There's about eight guys on that roster and you were definitely one of them. So you'll always hold a very special place in this school's history, my man. I appreciate it, my man. I really do. Thank you. All right. Okay. He's AJ Bramlett. I'm Mike Luke. Thanks for listening to the AZ Wildcats podcast.